everybody. Welcome back to our final episode this week with uh, with our guest, Mary Halverson. And as you've been hearing all this week, my co-host is Joe Gore. Hiya. And uh, today's topic is is one of a, of a balancing act, so to speak, where we talk about how Mary, you know, takes more uh, free-based improvisational ideas and combines them with more traditional, you know, playing over changes, jazz standard stuff. Yeah, some outside guitar players play outside because it's the only way they can play. And, uh, uh, and, uh, but Mary occupies both worlds. Even more impressive than that, she shifts between dimensions with great ease. Yeah. <laughs> um, she, she integrates them really well and uh, in surprising ways. And uh, she uh, talked earlier with us this week about, about free playing in general. But this is specifically about integrating those worlds and how to, how to you know, bring those possibly conflicting impulses to you know, one common musical cause. They, they can live in the same sphere, uh, sphere of, uh, of influence, for sure. If you want to hit us up, you can reach us at chasingfrets at premierguitar.com. So enjoy our final episode this week with the great Mary Halverson. All right, Mary, one of the most interesting things that I love about your music, uh, especially on your new record, Artlessly Falling, uh, is how you take, how you mix kind of the old and the new. And now that I've been able to hang with you this week and learn that we have some of the shared, uh, some shared grunge rock influences, <laughs> um, and I'm still trying to think of a name for that all female Smashing Pumpkins uh, tribute band that you're going to start. <laughs> but it sounded like when you were in your first years as taking jazz lessons, did you initially come from a more straight ahead bebop? foundation before branching off yeah i mean that that's what i was studying i mean basically when i was a beginner you know i was learning um jazz standards and chords and progressions and that i I think about that as sort of what i learned fundamentally and then branched out from there to to different stuff and how long were you playing before you started to compose your own music? Um, I mean, I think I was composing a little bit right away. I think I was. Always- I guess in the formal sense, I, I'm not there, but I mean, like we mentioned before, getting together and improvising, mm-hmm. and that, of course, is a, is a way of composing. But like, my question is more like, when did you like, okay, I'm going to write a tune and then maybe get some friends to play it? Uh, probably in college was when I got mm-hmm. most into that writing tunes, and then I was also doing a lot of you know, we were playing standards. We were, I was really interested in, in the quote unquote downtown scene in New York. You know, this would have been in the late nineties. So I was, I was going to a lot of shows, um, at the knitting factory and tonic and, and checking out John Zorn and, and Tim Burns blood count. I remember I was really into that and Mark Rebo, um, Nels Klein. And so part of what I was doing too was, was maybe trying to transcribe or learn some of that music so there was a lot of different stuff i was i was into but i'd say for composing i probably started doing it in in college and then more seriously um you know in my early 20s is when i I really started writing a lot do you find that when you compose tunes that it brings to light maybe uh influences that weren't maybe at top of mind sometimes yeah i mean that's that's always great I, i always think if if you're writing and and you can't pinpoint an influence specifically, you know, that that's a good thing. I, I always think like, but sometimes this stuff just comes out, you know, if I'm listening to a lot of deer hoof and then I sit down to write a tune, it, it might sound like a deer hoof tune. <laughs> and so I think, you know, it's nice to have all these different in- influences. And, you know, you'll see this a lot where people say, oh, it's a cross between X and Y, you know, kind of naming two distinct um, or two very specific bands. Um, and I think ideally for me is, you know, you'd be listening to so much music. Maybe there's so many influences that it, it's completely blurred. And you and, and if you can't really pinpoint one that's too strong, I, I think that's that's a good thing. Doesn't every creative musician hate having to describe their music as a cross between or having it described as a cross between? I would, the, I would imagine. The creative that. process is so much more expansive than that, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, but it does happen. You know, you see music get described as, 
I mean, I also understand that people are looking for a way to to define or, or categorize something, which is the same thing with genres. You know, it, it's hard for me to say like, oh, this is this is free jazz or whatever. It doesn't always exactly um, things don't always fit so neatly into categories. But but, it, you know, people are always trying to put categories onto music. Mm -hmm. One of the kind of things we jotted down about today's episode was how you combine the traditional with the experimental. Is that something in your development you consciously wanted to do or thought about, or did, was that just kind of a byproduct of developing your own style? I think it's something I've always been interested in, that, that you can merge a bunch of different influences and not have it be like, oh, now I'm doing my jazz thing, and now I've moved into my experimental thing. Um, but, but how to have some kind of a cohesive voice uh, between these different areas of music. Uh, and not to say that it's going to be the same for both, but, you know, if you're playing changes over a tune, that's probably the primary thing. But if you can, you know, have a voice that somewhat um, can carry over so that maybe you can bring in some other influences or, or some some more experimental ideas into that, for me, that would be kind of ideal. And, it, you know, it's not always easy to do. And it's something I've, I've thought a lot about is how, how to try to do that. And I'll give you an example. So... When I was in, I went to the new school, the jazz school for a year, my junior year of college, and, and I was learning a lot of tunes. And at some point, I got kind of disillusioned with it. And I, I just like completely put it aside. And I was interested in, in working on more experimental stuff. And I was doing a lot of free playing and, and like I was talking about in the last episode, developing my own exercises. And then about 10 years later, I was like, I think, you know, I, I miss playing tunes. I, I want to play some tunes. And when I sat down to do it, it was like I had gone back 10 years in time. Like I, it was almost like a different person because I hadn't figured out how to integrate all the stuff I'd been working on for the past 10 years into the tune playing, which was weird. So I, I spent some time trying to think about that, which to me, in, in some sense, meant relearning how I thought about tunes and how I worked on tunes. What were some of the new insights? I mean, you know, I think a lot of these, a lot of these things I'd worked on, intervallic stuff, or, you know, like we were talking about in the last uh, episode, too, of open strings, using open strings, there's no reason those things can't be applied to, to playing over changes. So I think, for me, it was almost like erasing how I had been taught and how I had thought about it before. And instead of going by a method, just just coming up with my own way to kind of make sense of it, um, while still being true to playing the changes, but, but trying to incorporate some other stuff in. And I think what I realized at that time is everybody's brain is wired so differently. So the way I think about a tune might not be the same way you think about it. And, you know, sometimes the way you're taught things don't exactly make sense. So, so just trying to find a way that, that makes sense to me to, to think about the fretboard, to think about these changes and really just trial and error. Like how can I take some of the stuff I've learned and, and come up with exercises to use some of that stuff um, in a tune setting? I don't have an easy answer. It's something I'm still working on, but I, I do like the idea that, that, you know, even if you're shifting to different settings, you're, you're still the same guitarist. To go back on your Thing about learning tunes are you a caged person i don't mean that in the literal sense i mean that in the fretboard organizational sense a cage person what do you mean a cage Ca like the cage system is that something you i guess not because i don't know what it is oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a way of using the open chord c a g e and d mm -hmm. to map out scales and chords and arpeggios across the neck uh no i never learned it and i guess i wow. i guess not i guess i don't think about it that way well, if you, you know, or, or, or not, I mean, cage system is a relatively, relatively, you know, new term. And I, I was certainly trained that way, but we never mm -hmm. called it cage system. I mean, if you practiced doing, you know, doing scales and multiple mm -hmm. positions on the neck, you're playing I caged. Um, it, the cage meaning, me, yeah, C-A-G-E-D. So, if you know, if you're playing, you know, a, a, a G scale mm -hmm. down at the third fret, you know, that would, you know, that would be the, you know, the, the G position. Oh, like Jason's this, got uh, the guitar. This kind of shape, this would be the E shape of a G chord. I see. And no, this would I be the A shape of a C chord, you know. And I don't, I don't, I guess I don't think about it that way. I mean, the way I try to think about it is just understanding, knowing the fretboard in a way that, that I can understand where I am you know, in any note or where, you know, where in accord I am. But I almost have my own way of organizing that in my head, if, if that makes sense. Can you describe it at all? Uh, um, Just, we're on we're on video and you, you can't, we can see Mary and you can't. When I said that, she grimaced like you wouldn't believe. Um, 
I mean, you think intervalically. You've, you've mentioned that several times. Like yeah. intervals are, are probably a big thing of your con part of your concept. I do think intervalically. That's true. And and I think for me, it's sort of chipping away at 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 learning the guitar neck well. I mean, you know, as we know, there's a million different places you can play the same note on guitar. So just kind of chipping away at learning how to connect the dots, you know, and and think about all the different ways you can connect lines intervalically, um, ways, different ways you can maybe voice the same thing. But for me, a lot of it too is just ear training. You know, the better you can mm. hear stuff and then the better, you know, the fretboard, the freer you're going to be. And then you won't be as confined to, to patterns and, and certain positions and things like that. Were you a big transcriber in college? Did you transcribe a lot? Uh, I did transcribe quite a bit. Yeah. What were the What were the your favorite people to transcribe? Um, a lot of horn players. Mm -hmm. Maybe Eric Dolphy, uh, wow. Coltrane. <sighs> yeah, I, I don't know. I would. It would. It would be almost. I never did like an extensive. I'm going to transcribe a lot by this person. Mm -hmm. It would more be like, oh, here's a, a solo or a tune that interests me. So I'm going to try to learn it. And I think it's interesting to transcribe non-guitarists on guitar yeah. because it's just, it's nice to, to hear something will sound so different on a guitar than, than it would on a horn. So I always enjoyed that. I know in grad school, it was a requirement for us to not transcribe somebody of your own instrument. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, it was, it was, a, and it was a pretty, I mean, for being in Northern Iowa, I went to University of Northern Iowa, uh, it was a pretty, it is, still is a, a pretty open-minded department. Like my combo, my second year of grad school was me on guitar, an alto player, and a guy on uh, running sounds on a computer, on a okay. laptop. And and we would play like Radiohead songs or whatever, or, or Chris Potter's versions of Radiohead songs. <laughs> or, you know, and those kind of experiences opened me, opened my eyes up and opened my playing up just as much as learning all the things you are or transcribing a blues by Jim Hall or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, I was just going to say, when you're, when you're uh, composing or arranging mm -hmm. for a group, you know, you're coming in with a chart. Do you map out where the structured and free sections are? I mean, might your chart say, you know, it, you know, when we get to letter C, go, you know, go free and then, you know, and then return to the head at letter D. I mean, is there a, is there a roadmap to a structure Again, I'm talking about ensemble playing where you have uh, where you have to coordinate with the group. Right. I mean, usually what I try to do when I'm writing compositions for an ensemble that also involves improvisation is I try to have it happen in, in different ways. So it is possible that, that it would be kind of like you described where there'd be a section and then maybe it's it's totally open, in which case I would give very little instruction. And the only thing we know is that we're eventually going to get to the next section and we know what that sounds like. So trying to create something that naturally leads into that. But it, it, it also would be common that within the same group, there might be something where there's a, a form that people are playing over. Uh, so it could be a set of changes or some kind of a vamp or, or a set of chords or whatever it is. Um, and it could be for a specific soloist or maybe it's just a section where anybody who feels like it can play. So I try to set up different structures so it's not always uh, predictable what type of improvisation is going to happen. So it's not always like, all right, now they played the melody and now they're playing free. Um, but but so that it might be mixed up a little bit so that sometimes it's not so obvious. Maybe the, the composition and the improvised sections are a little bit more uh, melded together. Um, but that's always interests me, just using it in, in different ways. And, and conversely, you know, we've... We we haven't this week spent a lot of time talking about your solo playing, and that's one of the most remarkable things about about what you do. Is it a similar approach with solo? Do you have some kind of general roadmap, or is it just hands on strings um, uh, uh, express? Um, well, solo playing, it's something I didn't do until I'd been playing for many years with bands. Um, it always seemed kind of intimidating to me, or I didn't have a clear concept of what I wanted to do, so I just didn't do it. Um, and then when I did my solo album, Melt Frame, I actually came up with a concept and sat down and, and really spent some time working on it. And, and I really learned a lot from playing solo. Um, but what what that project was, was covers. So it was solo guitar versions of, of and the covers defined pretty broadly. You know, some of them were, were standards, like I did uh, Duke Ellington Solitude. Um, some of them were pieces by friends of mine, contemporaries. One of them was the song Platform by Chris Laika. Um, I did a, a tune by by Roscoe Mitchell. Um, so it was all kinds of different stuff. And and 
within that, I tried to have as much variety as possible. Actually, kind of like I was just saying. So some of them were, were sticking to the tune a little bit more. Some of them were really using it like as a jumping off point. With Solitude, I, I really just used the melody um, and not the harmony. Um, so I tried to extract kind of the essence of the melody and just have that be its own thing. And it was really difficult. I think one thing I learned too through, through that process was how to leave space because I would record myself practicing these things and listen back. And I just sounded like a nervous talker, you know, not leaving any kind of breath or anything. And and what I realized is it feels so different than it, than, than you feel. It comes across very differently. So if I leave what I feel like is an awkward amount of silence, it actually sometimes felt like it wasn't enough when, when I listened back. So trying to really play with taking my time and, and not being in a rush and not trying to do everything. It sounds like you devote a fair amount of time to reviewing your playing, like listening back to performances and uh, yeah, I think with fresh ears. I did that more with solo playing than anything else. Um, I think partly because I found it very hard to have perspective on what it sounded like when I was working on it. Um, so I would record versions of the song and then listen back and think, oh, I didn't like this or that about it, and then try to chip away at it. So that it was something I found that very helpful, listening back to it. But, you know, I haven't worked on solo playing in a long time, I think, because I kind of played the, the music from that album quite a bit and, and was ready to move on. But, but you know, now that we're in quarantine here, I've been playing a lot of guitar and, and spending a lot of time alone. I've been working on it again, but not with tunes. I've actually just been, for what we were talking about before, basically just playing free on guitar, but trying to create uh, things that feel like songs to me, that still feel like I'm creating structure in the moment. But that's something I've been working on. It's possible. I haven't thought specifically about it, but I might do an album at some point. I, I hope this isn't redundant to what I was asking a minute ago about, you know, to what extent do you go into a solo composition, a, a improvised solo piece with a, with a, with a roadmap. You know, what, what you said about the nervous talker, you know, it's, 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 I mean, all of us as musicians know that our perception of time when we're on stage and cranked up and full of adrenaline is very different from how, you know, a listener experiences the time. And I know exactly what you mean about that, you know, like playing like a motor mouth person who never shuts up, <laughs> especially because especially I am a motor mouth person who never shuts up. <laughs> but do you have any thought, uh, thoughts about, about, about pacing, um, about, about the rate at which you introduce change? You know, when you want to hear Derek Bailey play, it's a new, a new sound every second or two. I mean, it's in, incredibly dense yeah. interchange of, of gestures and you know things that you know when I hear some of some of your solo work and I'm, I'm talking about melt frame so I'm talking mm -hmm. five years back and it might not even reflect where you are anymore um it's a more you you know you linger with an idea for a while you know you know longer than than Bailey might have um yeah any any thoughts about about pacing the, the rate at which you introduce ideas I mean, I think, you know, as you were saying, there's also a time and a place when just extreme density and, and um, switching ideas can be really nice. But I, I think, um, you know, having the ability to really pace things and often to stay on ideas a lot longer than might be intuitive, because I think, like you said, it comes across very differently. You know, this is something that's gotten easier for me the older I get, maybe because I'm slowing down a little bit, but I don't have that need to like say everything or, or do everything, but just to try to really see what you can extract from one small idea or maybe gradually build something. Um, but again, it's all about balance. Cause like I said, I think sometimes you just want to unleash a whole bunch of stuff at once and that can be nice too, but to, but to try to just have a little more focus. Um, and it's interesting. You're talking about sense of time, how the audience might have a different time. This whole year in terms of time has been so weird for me. Like I'll do something and I'll think it was two days ago and then I'll realize it was like a month and a half ago. Um, so now I, we're in this weird zone where time almost seems to mean nothing. So I don't know. I don't know how that applies to playing exactly, but I've just been thinking about that. Because well, I think a lot of I think frequently, you know, when we hear a player and that we would describe it as overplaying. I mean, yeah, sometimes it's as simple as is you know ego or. You know, they've just got to talk over everything. Your comparison to someone who never leaves a gap in a conversation mm -hmm. um, seems really apt. I think a lot of the time it, it's not ego. It's the sense of, oh, my God, I'm I'm boring people if I stand still for, for two seconds. Exactly. And maybe that two seconds feels like 10 seconds when you're cranked up on mm -hmm. stage and and that's why listening back is good because you can you can kind of listen and critique yourself and say, oh, my God, I didn't even realize I was doing that. But it, it can be really nice to, to leave some space. That was my that was my attempt at leaving space right there just a second ago. 
<laughs> so, did I know it was only about two seconds, but I bet it felt like 15 seconds. Huh? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much, Mary, for hanging with us and uh, sharing some time and sharing some wisdom. What a fun week. Yeah, it's been so yeah, much fun. Me. And I am so excited to see your forthcoming book. And I'll be the first one in line to get it. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Jason and Joe. This was fun. <laughs>